Hello YouTube, I am ABC, and today I'm coming out with another tutorial. I'm gonna make a game maker tutorial for today. Now I've been on a hiatus from game maker for a while. I've been um uh, trying to devote my time to Java, but I saw this Angry Birds commercial, and I saw this equation that they used in the in the advertisement that was a, an equation that I had learned that very week in physics. So I couldn't resist the opportunity to make a tutorial about it, and I I figured out how to do it in game maker, and so I decided to show you guys just just quick game maker tutorial in between all the Java tutorials I'm making. And I think you'll find it fun, fun and interesting. This is about the Angry Birds Space expansion. Because um, of the physics co contest behind it, I'm going to spend one tutorial talking about the physics behind it, and then I'm going to spend another tutorial talking about the, how, to, how to implement this in Game Maker. If you don't care anything about the physics and we just want to skip straight on to the Game Maker, you can click on this Game Maker symbol, symbol that I'm drawing. There we go. It's a pretty bad game maker symbol, but I did my best. So go ahead and click on that if you don't want to watch a physics one. By the way, I'm sorry that the frame rate's so weird for this tutorial. Uh, it's something with Cam Studio. It usually works fine for me, but lately it's been doing that. I'm sorry about that. Just um, I guess I just just had a little with it. So now we get on to the tutorial. So today we're talking about physics, and the first thing that you're going to learn in any physics class is the difference between vector values and scalar values. So the difference is vector values, they contain both direction and magnitude. Scalar only contain magnitude. Uh, good comparison is velocity and speed. Now speed, um, if you say five, going five meters per second, you don't know what direction it's going in. Well, in velocity, you have a predefined positive direction and negative direction. So if you say positive is right, negative is left, if you say it's going negative 5 meters per second, you know it's going to the left at negative 5 meters per second. And if it's going 5 meters per second, you know it's going, you know it's going right at 5 meters per second. And speed can only be, it has to be above zero. If it goes below negative, it, it's, it doesn't work that way. It it's, uh, has to be above zero. Now, don't let that make you think that all scalar values have to stay above zero. The thing is, they never show a direction with, the, with their value. So an example of one that can go below zero but doesn't doesn't imply direction is temperature. So temperature, if it's negative five, that doesn't imply that it's going different direction, it's just negative five. That's an example of a scalar value that can be negative. So there are tons more scalar values and vector values. More scalar values would be let's see, area area we've got energy volume. These are all values that only contain a magnitude. So some more vector ones are, are acceleration. Weight is also considered one. Which, by the way, weight is different from mass. Mass is a scalar, and weight is a vector. It's a little bit confusing difference, but you don't need to understand it right now. Direction is also one. Displacement. The big one, big one I talk about is Force. That's what the reason why I brought this whole thing up because I wanted to show talk to you about force. So let me just clear this all out. Hopefully, you understand just need a vector and a scalar right now. So now we're going to talk about force. Okay, first things first. Force is defined as F is equal to mass times. Out there. Acce acceleration, it's not going to fit in my screen, but oh well. Acceleration. So, it's basically how hard you push something. So, if you if you want to push a big heavy thing, so with a high mass, and you want to achieve a certain acceleration, it's going to require more, more force than something with a lower mass to achieve the same acceleration. So, force is basically how hard you push something. So, to give, um, to work out an example, sort of, we have a flat surface, just pretend it's flat, and let's say we have a box on that surface. Okay, so that's horrible. Let me fix this. Um, flat surface, we have a nice square box on that surface. That's a lot better, isn't it? So now, let's say you, you push the box like that. This is how you define vectors or forces in particular. Um, the how long it is says 
how hard you're hard, how the, uh, how hard you're pushing it, what the magnitude of the vector is, and what direction it is in. Shows. So this is going down has a both the downward section. This would be downwards, and this would be the horizontal section. So it has both the downwards and a horizontal section. Now this box, as you can try this yourself, if you did this with a box on a, on a solid surface, it's not going to move downwards. It's, it's the floor is going to stop it. This is because Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the force, the floor is actually push up on the on the the block that on the box to cancel out this horizontal direction of the or this uh, vertical direction of the force we're applying to the block. So this would be called normal force, and it's just applied to anything to cancel out. Um, if there's no vertical move in the vertical direction, it's because normal force normal force is canceling it out. So, in addition to this, we have gravity. Gravity. Which, you know, it's always pushing down on things. And this will require a bigger normal force because it's going to need to uh, cancel out both gravity and our force that we're applying. And then there's some forces that work in this direction, too. There's the drag force due to air resistance because we're pushing it through air and the air is pushing on it. And there's also friction. This is caused because it's been in contact with the ground, so friction is pushing on as well. So when you take physics, you're going to learn how to add up all, all kinds of vectors like this, and you're going to find out what the net direction is, which direction will end up going, and how fast it'll be going, and all that kind of fun stuff. But I just want to understand how to look at this and see, okay, this force is going this direction, and it's and how big they are depending on the length of the arrows, and such and such. So let's move on to the next thing. Next thing we're going to talk about is there are different ways to express forces. So we can either talk talk about them. We can either refer to them as bipolar, axial. Now axial is probably what you feel more comfortable with, so I'm going to explain that one first. So we're going to explain it as two values: the force in the x direction and the force in the y direction. X, y. So if this equals x equals five, y equals six. You could express this vector as uh, 5 i hat plus 6 j hat. So that just this is um, we're using this to show the direction and the magnitude to which it's going using an x value and a y value. Now the more correct one I suppose is the polar, which uh, take uses a direction and a magnitude. So it forms a so you, you decide what the horse uh, what the standard is the standard direction you, and based on that standard direction you find the angle according to I mean I mean that symbol that's called theta is basically the symbol used whenever you are reference, referencing an uh, angle and then we have the magnitude over here so I'll just call it mag which is the length of this line so we would say theta and the magnitude. So if we want to match up for this with this one, we can use the tagging theorem to find out the length of this one, this side. Actually, these are kind of bad values. Maybe I'm going to change the values. I'm going to make that 3, make that a 4. So that's 3, and that's a 4. So we can use the Pythagorean theorem, because that's the right angle. We can use the Pythagorean theorem to find out what the magnitude is. So in this case, the magnitude would be 5. And I don't know off the top of my head what the angle is, but we can find the angle using trigonometry. So those that's the difference between polar and axial. Now I'm going to show you how this can apply to our Angry Birds game. Just a quick example. So we have our slingshot with, with our bird attached to it. So there you go, there's my horrible drawing of a slingshot being pulled back by a bird, or a bird pulling back on a slingshot. Um, the way we're going to calculate, so what's going to happen is it's going to move in that direction with a certain force. And we're going to, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to take this point on, on our slingshot and we're going to calculate the difference in the x and the difference in the y. So I'll just call that y and this one x. And based on that, we're going to form, you know, our xi hat plus yj hat. 
thing to f figure out how far this is going, how fast this is going. So, it'll launch off, and then it'll be, let's say it's somewhere in this area. Alright, so, our, let's say our bird ends up there, from the uh, force from the slingshot. Let's say I have a big planet over here. So that's our planet. And it has a range going something like that. In reality, planets don't have ranges, but in this Angry Birds game, they do have ranges for the simplicity of the game. So, uh, for our purposes, it's um, within range of the planet. So now, in addition to its initial force caused by the slingshot, it's going to get another force that's going to draw it to the planet. That's a horrible line. Okay, it's going to draw it to the planet in roughly that direction. So, how do we figure out how big this force is and what direction it is? We're going to talk about that. So, let me just clear this, this slide off. So, we have our bird again. And let's say we have our planet over here. So, there's our planet. And let's say that it's in within the gravitational range of the planet. So, it's going to be pulled towards the planet. We're going to do this using a polar, polar rather than axial because it's easier in this case. So its angle would be like that. And we can find that easily using the point distance function in Game Maker. But we'll get to that when we get to the Game Maker section. But anyway, that's how I find the direction. And then we're also going to need to find out what the magnitude of the force is. And that's where that cool equation came in that you saw in the trailer. I'll just write it down. So the force of gravity is equal to the gravitational constant, which we'll talk about in a second, times the mass of the first object, the mass of the second object, all divided by r squared, which is the distance between the two. So um, r would be distance from here, the center of the bird, to over over here somewhere to the center of the of the planet. That's what that is. So there are two objects involved, the bird and the planet. Mass 1 is the mass of the first object, so we'll say the bird. And mass 2 is the mass of the planet, so... That's that. The gravitational force, or the gravitational constant, is this very, very small number. I'll just go ahead and write it out. The gravitational constant is equal to 6.673 times 10 to the power of negative 11. This negative 11 means that it's very, very small. This means it's 0 .0000, 0, 0, 0, 11 zeros, and then it starts with a number. So it's a very small number. That's what makes gravity a very weak force. Because only things as massive as planets are strong enough to pull anything towards it. Everything else has gravity, but it's so minimal that physicists don't even consider it when they're doing calculations. So that's how we find out the magnitude of this vector using this equation up here. But the problem now is that we have a polar coordinate, and we did our initial one when it got launched by the slingshot. We did that one using the axial system. So now we're going to talk about how to convert from polar to axial. So let's say we have our vector. Here is our vector. Going at that angle, and it's going to be, let's see, let's see, let's see, say 2. Because I could do that in my head. And we're going to make angle equal to 30 degrees, all right? We want to find out the x section and the y section, and to do this we're going to use trigonometry. So um, a quick review of trigonometry. There are three basic ones. There's tangent, there's cosine, and there is sine. And what this needle will give you, it will be, give you the ratio with right triangles, such as this one. So uh, with our st a standard right triangle, this is our theta, this will be the opposite side, this will be the hypotenuse, and this will be the adjacent side. Tangent is equal to the ratio between the opposite side and the adjacent side. Cosine is equal to the ratio between the adjacent side and the hypotenu hypotenuse and sine is equal to the ratio between opposite side and the hypotenuse. Uh, let's start with y. y is the opposite side and 2 is our, our uh, hypotenuse. So we could say that sine of 30 
is equal to the opposite side y over the hypotenuse of 2. So if we um, multiply both sides by 2, we get y equals sine of 30 times 2. And that's a pretty simple equation to work with. And this would be our y part of our uh, axial notation. We can use similar logic for the x section. Cosine of 30. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So it's going to be equal to x over 2. So if we rewrote this, we would get x is equal to cosine of 30 times 2. So if we wrote this in our notation, we would have cosine 30 times 2. And that would be our i hat. That's i hat. And we would add on our sine 30 times 2. And that will be our j hat. So there you go. That was how you convert from polar coordinates over to axial coordinates such as these I forgot to do right there. Now we'll move on to I believe is our final slide. And good thing too because I'm losing my voice. Now let's let's do a quick overview. I gotta make a quick drawing of our bird and our catapult again. Not looking forward to. There you go. But you say so myself, this one's a lot better than the previous one. So, it goes forward with initial force, and we decide that based on differences in the x's and differences in the y between the bird and the catapult. So you pull it farther back, the force will be greater. So you know x, y, and we'll notate that as x i hat plus y j hat. So the bird is then launched, and then once it gets there, we have a, we have a planet right here. And we'll assume that the bird is close enough to the planet to be within the correct range. And then once it's there, we would calculate the force of the vector based on the force is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. And then there's a number of things that could happen. So remember, it's still moving in, the, in the, that direction. From the from the catapult, or roughly that direction, it's a little different, I guess. And if the catapult had pushed it fast enough, then it'll just go outside the range of the of the planet and go its merry way. If the planet proves to be stronger, it'll nosedive into the planet. And if it's somewhere in between the two, it'll actually orbit around the planet, and it will go all the way around and it'll come back around, and it'll keep going in circles. This is usually an ellipse. Sometimes it can be circles. Very, very, very rarely it'll be circles, but usually it's an ellipse. And those are all the options that can happen to the bird. Either it'll crash, it'll go outside the orbit of the Earth, or it'll start orbiting around it. Or I said Earth, planet. Or it'll start orbiting around it. And that's what'll happen. So, that is all the physics behind angry birds. You might have been surprised how complicated it was. That's why I'm always intrigued. But next story, we're going to talk about how we can use these concepts to do it in physics. Oh, and one more thing. Um, in the description, I have a little quiz for you. Just a few questions to see whether you understand this. And if you don't understand it, you can look back in the video to, to try and figure out what's happening. If you understand the quiz, it'll make things a lot easier for you. So now that you understand the core concepts, you can go ahead and watch the next part where I go. And um, I guess I'll see you guys there.